Hey, welcome in everybody. This is Jared here with another concert review. This one is Jane's Addiction, Jacksonville, Florida, August 27, 2024. My first time ever seeing Jane's Addiction. Now, mind you, I'm not a diehard Jane's Addiction fan, but I definitely am a fan. And I just happened to go through their whole discography earlier this year. And when I saw that they were coming to Jacksonville with, you know, the classic lineup, back together for the first time since uh, 2010. I definitely was excited to go and wanted to go and it was just a definite for me. And uh, so basically, let me start off by saying the tickets for me, they, were, they weren't bad as far as the pricing goes. I saw for like weeks, some of the cheapest tickets were like 60 bucks which is like so much cheaper than like some of the other concerts I've been to. And I've been to a decent amount of concerts. So I really, really took a lot of time and effort to try and figure out what seats I wanted, the view I wanted. I decided that I didn't want to go in the pit this time. I was in the pit for Red Hot Chili Peppers, which was fine, but it's just insane how different every single ticket and every single view is. And it's not like the pit was bad for Red Hot Chili Peppers, but this time, I, this, this, this go around for my for this next concert, I wanted to have an actual seat, and nothing wrong with that. So I went ahead and bought my ticket. It was like I said, it was like sixty bucks, and with fees, it was only like seventy three dollars. So it wasn't the pit, it wasn't the lower section, but it was the next section, uh, right before you get into like the middle balcony and then the upper balcony. So kind of in that middle section down below. And it was right in front of the balcony too. One of the main things I wanted to do also was not get underneath the balcony because I've been to a NASCAR race where I was underneath the balcony up in Atlanta and my ears were ringing the worst they have ever rung in my life. It was for multiple days afterwards. So I didn't want to have that same issue at this concert. So yeah. I went ahead and bought my ticket. It was section 208. On the way to the venue, which was, the venue's called Bailey's Place. I've never been here before. I just wanted to kind of throw in there just for like <laughs> shits and giggles. I uh, was kind of listening to Ice Cube on the way up there, going through his discography right now. And I was listening to War and Peace, the Peace Disc, and then listening to Laugh Now, Cry Later. So just for like historical purposes that's what I was listening to on the way there. So get over to Jacksonville, you know, cross the bridge and everything. And Daly's Place is actually connected to the Jacksonville Jaguars NFL Stadium, which I believe is called Everbank Stadium. Now, I had never been to the stadium either, but I will say when I went and saw Guns N' Roses and Kiss years ago, just a few years ago, I noticed at the Vice Star Veterans Memorial uh, Arena, I think is what it's called, um, you could see the Jaguar Stadium out in the distance. And I believe in my KISS vlog, I took either a video or a picture of the this, this stadium out in the distance. So it was interesting pulling up because I was like, it was interested. It was interesting to see the Vice Star Arena out in the distance this time, just the kind of the, the opposite. but. Finding Daly's place was easy, and parking was free, and it was just right outside the venue. It wasn't like they had any like crazy special parking or anything like that that I really saw of. It was just, uh, you know, just come right in and park. Uh, it said the showtime was 7. I got there at like 5.30 just to have a little wiggle room, and I would say I was a little surprised. There weren't that many people there by the time I got there, and... Excuse me. I was looking around and kind of like Red Hot Chili Peppers, I didn't see a ton of Jane's Addiction shirts, anything like that. I did hear one person ask another person, is this where Love and Rockets is playing? And I thought that was interesting because Love and Rockets is one of the opening acts. I personally had never even heard of them, but I was interested to see what they looked and sounded like and uh, I knew that they were definitely the main opening act for Jane's Addiction. So 
getting in was a breeze. They didn't do much of a security check at all. Uh, they didn't have any wands. They didn't make you pull anything out of your pockets or anything. It's interesting just to kind of compare and contrast some of these concerts and what they do and what they don't do. I mean, honestly, not even just concerts, but any any event in general, but they honestly just kind of have like a turnstile type of thing where you just walk through it. I guess it's a metal detector and then they just gain your ticket and that's it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so th that was that. When you walk in, you, when you walk in the gates, you're in between Daly's place and the Jaguar stadium. And yeah, so they're interconnected and you can walk around and get food and drinks, of course, and you can walk on, you know, underneath and around the, the Jaguar stadium and all that. So of course, one of my first things that I always do when I go to any concert is I like to look at the merchandise always. I don't think that'll ever change to be honest with you, but my tradition is always getting a tour shirt and getting a poster or a lithograph, whatever you want to call it. And I knew this time around, I was not going to do a lithograph or a poster or anything like that because at the Red Hot Chili Peppers concert, I did it, continued the tradition, but I started to think to myself, these posters at these shows are so much money. I just think it's absurd when it gets to the point where it's like, I get two things from the merchandise stand and it ends up costing more than my actual ticket. So I said to, to myself this time, no, I'm not doing the poster and maybe down the road, I'll start to do the poster again at some point. But as of right now, I'm putting the whole poster tradition on hold, but definitely still going to do the shirt. So as I'm uh, walking around trying to find the merchandise, uh, which was like uh, near the back, they told me, I noticed if when I looked over to the left, they had this little section where you could walk out and look inside the Jaguar Stadium. And I thought that was just so cool. It was a great experience. And I think that's awesome they do that. I think that's such a cool touch and something they definitely should have, especially for these people that are going to Daly's Place. Um, because, you know, you're literally at an NFL stadium. That's cool. They just allow you that little access where you can look around, take pictures, videos, and just kind of see the eerie, empty field. And I have never been inside an NFL stadium personally, but I thought it was interesting because it actually seems smaller than what I expected. But it was cool because off in the distance too, they had on the video board, like something to the effect of like, we welcome Jane's Addiction, Love and Rockets. So definitely a highlight of the, the whole concert for sure. Wasn't expecting that at all. So after that, I decided to once again, just keep going on my journey to find that merchandise stand. And eventually I found it. Line wasn't too long and it was moving pretty quickly. So I've been to a decent amount of concerts in my life. And I will say when it comes to the merchandise, it normally takes me like two seconds to really analyze the options, figure out maybe what, what my plan A, what my plan B is as far as shirts go or whatever. But this time, I was struggling, absolutely struggling. I will say, I thought the Love and Rockets <laughs> merchandise, which there wasn't a lot, but they did have some, was cooler than the Jane's Addiction stuff, but I'm a big red, white, and black color fan. And they had some of the, that type of merchandise as far as the colors go, but Jane's Addiction, they didn't have a lot of variety. And the shirts that they had, I was, I was just, pretty baffled. I didn't think anything looked that great, to be honest with you. They did have three different tour shirts, but yeah, if you wanted to watch my vlog video, I show, I'm sure anything, pretty much anything that I specifically talk about, I, I show it in the video. So merchandise is definitely one of the things I showed in my vlog video. So as far as the three shirts go, they had this one shirt with like, it looked like it was like, I don't know, it was kind of like a, a, a gray camo shirt and it had the band members, but they were like distorted and they had like a kind of like a ripped up American flag in the background. And the band members looked like they were young and their like eyes had a, had sensors over them and then it had the tour dates on it. And so that was one of them. The next one was just a gray shirt with like pink lettering 
of course, uh, with the tour dates and Jane's Addiction, but it also had a naked chick on the front and the back. Um, it wasn't like fully naked, but her tits were 100% out. And then the next shirt was, you know, just, it was just another, it's just kind of like a generic gray Jane's Addiction shirt with, um, with Jane's Addiction and green lettering, and then it had the tour dates on the back. Um, and then it had some woman on the front. I'm not 100% sure who the woman is. Some people probably are like, are you kidding me? It's, it's what, it's so-and-so, but I'm not 100% sure. Just some woman. Uh, it seemed like, kind of like a, I don't know, maybe like a, it almost gave me like Virgin Mary vibes or something. I'm not 100% sure, but that was the other shirt. Long story short, it gets time, it gets, it's my turn to like pick my merchandise and I'm up at the register and I'm like, luckily they had a few different people so it wasn't like everyone's just like waiting behind me. But I was at the register and I'm like, first time in my life, I'm like, can I just see all three of these shirts? She brings me all three of these shirts and I'm just like racking my brain, can't figure it out. I was there for a while just trying to decide. I decided on the one with the band members and once again I even had to ask the woman I'm like is the, are these the band members it's hard to even tell she's like hmm yeah I think so so I was like oh that's just great so yeah I decided on that one I'm like I guess I'll do it and then I went ahead and bought it it was like $45 you know a few bucks extra with tax they also didn't even have a lithograph or a poster so it's like it, that didn't even matter so I got the shirt, kind of walked away, and I was like, just still racking my brain. I'm like, should I swap this out for something else? And I called my girlfriend to get advice, and I, uh, I ended up swapping it for the kind of generic one with like the Virgin Mary or whatever you want to call it, because I was thinking to myself, that's the only shirt that I didn't really have issues with. It was just kind of bland and boring. Uh, I almost, I, I would have gotten the gray one with the pink lettering if there weren't, if there wasn't a woman with tits all over it. Cause I'm just not really trying to walk around Walmart with that and like little kids seeing that or whatever. So unfortunately, uh, I did decide to switch and the good thing was they switched no problem. Uh, the woman was very nice about it. Um, it was actually funny cause of course like you get these people that work you know, at these stands, and they're not, like, really fans of the band or whatever, and, uh, I guess somebody had just told her that Dave Navarro was in Jane's Addiction, and he, she was actually, like, freaking out and so happy, she was like, I used to watch him on Ink Master, so she was excited he was gonna be there that night, so went ahead and swapped the shirt, and then, uh, headed to my seat in Daly's place, once again, never been here before, I walk in, it's an outdoor, it's an outdoor amphitheater, and before, my Red Hot Chili Peppers concert in June. I had never been to an outdoor amphitheater, but that one was in Tampa, the Mid Florida Credit Union Amphitheater, which was pretty big. This one is definitely smaller. It holds a, it holds about a little over five thousand people, so it's a little bit bigger than like a House of Blues or like a Hard Rock, uh, like a Hard Rock Orlando type of vibe. So, but it, yeah, it's it's still that outdoor amphitheater vibe with the fans and everything uh, up on the ceiling. So got to my seat, of course everyone's filing in, and I will say the view was fine, but I was not a fan of the physical seats. They were uncomfortable and small, and especially when people started to file in and sit around me, I it was definitely something that dampered the experience for me, that I <laughs> definitely... If I ever go to this venue again, which I, I'm sure I will at some point, I don't think, I can't imagine I will ever really get a seat again for this venue. I, I, I'm, I'm only going to try to get pit for this venue if I ever go to this venue again. Um, don't really recommend the seats. Um, so, yeah, so, so it was about, let's see, it was about 6.30, when I got to my seat, like I said, showtime was seven. And I'm kind of used to when it says showtime seven, that's when doors open, but the doors opened at six apparently. So anyway, 
Uh, once again, I'm not familiar with Love and Rockets, but at like 6.59, this dude comes out to the stage and he was a DJ. I don't know his name. He was just this like kind of, it was just this bald white guy who started DJing. And I actually wasn't sure at the time, like, is this the opening act? Is this Love and Rockets? And I, I asked someone next to me and he's like, no, Love and Rockets is like a few different dudes. <laughs> he's like, so... This guy was just DJing and playing some like classic rock, but with the, you know, hip hop DJ flair to it. And that's so common nowadays, I noticed with a lot of uh, rock songs, they try to like remix them and do like different hip hop varieties. Me personally, I've never been a fan of these really. And I thought, I thought this dude kind of started out like pretty decent and he played some recognizable songs and talking about like, had like a whole Nine Inch Nails, Fall to Pieces, Velvet Revolver. He did some Green Day, uh, he did some other stuff, but I thought he started out like okay. But after like two songs, I'm like, it just seemed like it was going downhill. It didn't seem like he was putting a lot of like flair on, on the songs and like when he did, it would, to me it was just annoying, no offense to him, but I'm just not a big fan of these like remixes and I don't think the fans were very like <laughs> receptive to it they weren't really reacting to him it got to the point where so he, he did it for about like 30 minutes but it got to the point where like near his last song there was someone next to me flat out booing him and <laughs> then his his uh his set or whatever you want to call it <laughs> Uh, just like ended abruptly like people just started coming out to the stage and just like taking apart his equipment <laughs> I'm just like, I, I mean it just I don't know I, I was just kind of like chuckling to myself not at him but just in general I just it the whole thing was just weird so I don't really know I kind of consider him like the first opening act personally even though he's not really listed as like an opening act um so yeah Anyway, he finished up, and, uh, so, yeah, I want to say it was, like, yeah, it was, like, 8 o'clock that Love and Rockets came out and performed, so they're, like, a three-piece band, it's uh, these three older dudes, uh, they all have sunglasses on, and I was super curious to hear what they sounded like, and so, they kind of look punk rock, they have like an 80s kind of sound to them. Also just like kind of like an alternative sound. I also went online, I saw later, they are also classified as indie. Uh, so, I'm not gonna lie, no offense to them, not saying they perform bad, but they were not my cup of tea. It was disappointing for me. Uh, I, I kind of, they kind of gave me like almost Collective Soul, Oasis, U2, Fastball kind of vibes. I will say, I thought the drummer was the artist, or he, he was the performer out of the three that stood out the most for me, but I didn't think the other guys had a lot of stage presence, and uh, they, I, I didn't recognize a single song, but I'm sure they have a big fan base, like an underground fan base, cult following type of deal. Type of deal. Uh, it didn't seem like during the songs, the fans were like super receptive. There were a couple songs where people got up and like uh, were into it. Uh, but I will say after each song, they did get a good reception as far as people clapping and cheering and everything. So. I'm probably in the minority as far as not being a huge fan of Love and Rockets and their performance, but they really, they didn't move the needle for me. And uh, yeah, they played for a good hour and it got to the point where I was like, are they co-headlining with Jane's Addiction or are they like the actual opener? They were the actual opener. But so once they finished around nine, I started to think to myself, I'm like, this is like, this is so weird and different for me. I will say, after the DJ and after Love and Rockets, I, uh, I was getting a little tired. It was, <laughs> not that it was getting super late, but I'm not used to the, the headliner going on that late. So I was actually thinking to myself, like, are they running late? Uh, maybe they're trying to kind of stretch this out because they're running late or somebody, you know, something's going on, but uh, in retrospect, I did I did look at the statistics, and they do this every single night, so it's, they weren't late or anything. This is just 
this this show that you go to it's going to be like this every time where it says showtime is seven or whatever and jane's addiction won't even come on until 9 30 so they finally came on at 9 30 and man they open with kettle whistle now i'm not a huge fan of this song but I will say, after watching it live and after watching them open with this song, I'm definitely a fan of this song. The heavy, loud parts really gave me goosebumps, and I will never forget that. I, uh, I thought it was actually a really cool song to open with, and also looking at the statistics. So for this tour, this cla you know, classic reunion tour, whatever you want to call it, uh, they're, they've been opening with Kettle Whistle at every single concert, and Dave Navarro actually before this tour, the last time he had played this song with Jane's Addiction was 2001, so it, they're actually uh, bringing it back in, in, a, in a sense, um, which is super, super cool. Interesting song to open with. Um, and yeah, they were just, they're so much louder and heavier than the other acts, and there was definitely an electricity in the air, and uh, yeah, they go into whores, and then Pigs in Zen, Ain't No Right, Ted Just Admit It, uh, Summertime Rolls. Summertime Rolls, I thought it was interesting. Um, Eric Avery actually kind of pulls out like a stool and uh, he has his, uh, you know, his opening bass notes that he does for this song. And man, that song is just like so trippy, so 90s. And it's just, it was, it was, a, it was a really good performance. And uh then they do Jane Says as the seventh song. And I remember when Jane, I'm not a big fan of this song. I know it's like their most popular song, but I will say when Jane Says was, was happening, I was thinking to myself, man, they're playing this early in the set. I was thinking they would play this like to start the encore or something, but they, uh, they played it seventh in the set. And actually, once again, in retrospect, they ended up playing 14 songs. So it was actually smack dab in the middle of the set. It wasn't early in the set, but I will say it was cool to hear the crowd so into this song. Uh, of course, just singing along and uh, really enjoying themselves. They go into Mountain Song, of course, classic. Uh, I will say, man, some of these some of these big songs from Jane's Addiction got such a great reception from the crowd. They were really into it. And then the night song, Imminent Redemption, this is a brand new song that just came out uh, for this tour. I will say, out of all the songs on the set list, I hate to say it, but this was the one where most people got up and went to the bathroom or got a drink or something. There were a lot of people heading to uh, the concession stands for Imminent Redemption. But uh, Perry Farrell was saying before the song that he was very, very proud of this song and uh, was very excited to perform it for everyone. Uh, as far as my opinion on this song, I've listened to it numerous times and I'm not saying it's a bad song, but it doesn't do a lot for me. I was really hoping this concert would, would make me love it more, but it didn't really do a lot for me, uh, the performance for that song goes. They go into three days, then she did. Ocean Size. I'll say Ocean Size, man. One of the highlights of the concert for me, uh, Dave Navarro, his solo on this song is just smoking. And he killed it. He killed it live. And I actually had, I got a video of that one. And uh, really, I mean, that has, that might be my favorite all-time James Addiction solo. So then they go into Stop. Uh, once again, I'm sure in the, I'm in the minority. Stop's one of the most popular songs of their whole entire discography. Now, I'm not a huge fan of it, but I will say listening to it in person was much better than the studio version, especially like the parts where it actually stops and uh, you just have that moment where it's like over 5,000 people and it's just like dead silent and then they just go right back into the song. Super, super cool. And then they end with Ben Cott Stealing, of course, uh, which is the song that actually got me into Jane's Addiction uh, back in 2000, back in 
the 2000s, uh, I was introduced to Jane's Addiction through Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, and that's Ben Scott Stealing was on that on that video game. So another weird thing, and you might have noticed by the way I kind of described this, uh, they didn't do an encore. Like they just do 14 songs straight through. They play for an hour and a half, which is fine. So they ended around 11 o'clock. Uh, and it was just a different show for sure. I'm not used to, I'm not used to, um, there not being an encore than just doing songs straight through. I'm not super used to hour and a half sets, but then again, Red Hot Chili Peppers and Scorpions were the last two bands that I saw and they both kind of did hour and a half sets. But in general, I think most bands or artists do like at least two hours more than that. Uh, I don't really mind hour and a half set. That's fine. Uh, so they did five songs from Ritual, and then four songs from Nothing Shocking, three songs from the first live album, Jane's Addiction. They did, obviously, the one song, Cattle Whistle, and then the, the Eminent Redemption song. So really, really classic heavy. Now, once again, I'm sure I'm in the minority on this. For me, I am more of a fan of Jane's Addiction's newer stuff. I'm talking about stuff from Stray, stuff from the stuff from The Great Escape. And I was hoping they would play some stuff from those albums, but I didn't expect them to, especially with the classic lineup reuniting and everything. But very, very heavy on the old material from, you know, the first three albums. Which I'm sure 99% of fans want and love and enjoy. And I'm, I'm totally cool with it. I, uh, but like I said, I'm just more of a fan of the newer stuff. So if I had like a little nitpicky thing, that would be that. Wish they'd maybe just throw, throw in some of those songs, but I don't know if they would with it being the classic lineup and everything. So I kind of wanted to go through each band member's performance. Uh, Dave Navarro, he is so fucking cool. Like, he just looks cool. Um, he's in his 50s, and he, he's still just, like, I think he looks like such a badass with the hat and the, uh, you know, the paint that he has on his eyes and everything. Um, and he plays so good, and he has that, like, rock and roll stance where, his, you know, his legs are spread apart, and he just has that stance. He does a lot of messing around with his, uh, you know, his pedals and his board that he has in front of him. A lot of experimenting. He'll get on his uh, knees sometimes and just, like, playing around with that. But he was great. I, I don't I don't have a single issue with him. Um, thought he was definitely for me the uh, he was my favorite part about this performance. Perry Farrell, I will say, man, he uh, he's he still got it. He he has he has he has a really good stage presence. He still dances. He's still goofy as hell. Um, even at his age and everything, he still got that energy. And uh, I love how much he talks to the crowd, especially just, you know, in between songs. You know, of course, like, a lot of it is just goofy shit, talking about love and peace and shit like that. Um, and he did a lot of, you know, he did some talking about, like, basically saying fuck politics and stuff like that. Uh, he was definitely encouraging the crowd to get high. And even at times, he would, like, personally talk to, like, certain people in the crowd. Like, at one point, he was talking to, like, a little kid and stuff and uh, talking about, like, you know, the memories associated with the concert and whatnot. He, uh, he, he just, he kind of gives me Scott Weiland vibes. And I think they actually did collaborate at some point. Uh, he definitely has, like, a Scott Weiland vibe to him. He's, he's a trip, man. He is a trip. Uh, as far as his voice goes, I will say, live in person, I really, I didn't have really much of an issue with his voice, especially at his age. I thought his voice sounded good. Uh, there were, at there was at least one time, I, I, will, I will say, Summertime Rolls, near the end of that song, I, he wasn't going for the super high notes like he would have back in the day, which was noticeable to me, but, you know, it is what it is. He's older. It's okay. Not a big deal. I will say, though, looking back on the videos that I took and listening to him, I don't think he sounded as good in the videos as he did in person live. And that definitely happens at times, I noticed, with artists. Like, I'm a diehard Guns N' Roses fan, and... 
Axl Rose gets so much flack for his voice, especially nowadays. And I always tell people, like, if you're there live, he sounds great. And with the acoustics of the arena and just the amplifiers and everything that's going on, he sounds great. You listen to YouTube videos, you look at video, you listen to videos that you took, and it's like, oh, he did not sound nearly as good. <laughs> um, I'll say that's kind of similar to Perry Farrell uh, as far as his voice goes. Uh, something interesting, he, he had like a little stand at the front of the stage, and it's kind of hard to tell from my view, but it looked like he had like, it wasn't really a mic stand, but it was just like a stand where he would like kind of fiddle around with it at times and like be hitting buttons. I, I want to say maybe it was just like a little stand that had some, like he could play, he could do some samples and some, you know, effects and stuff. I could be wrong, but that's what it looked like for, from my perspective. But, uh, yeah, those two were good. You know, you have Eric Avery on bass, and he, uh, he was, he was good. He performed well. I liked how he was, he was into it during the show. He would dance. He would definitely have his dance moves and dance around, which I thought was cool. He wasn't just fucking standing there like a fucking statue all day. He definitely was into it, which was cool. And then uh, you got Steven Perkins on the drums. Um, I remember, I remember specifically when, right when the show was starting and they all came out on the stage, like he was one of the first people I saw. He just immediately took his shirt off and got on the drum, drum kit and, uh, I was ready to fucking go, but uh, he was good. Threw multiple drumsticks out to the crowd, and uh, yeah, no no complaints there. So overall, I thought the performance was solid. I thought the performance was good. Of course, there's some nitpicky things I you know I've mentioned before, but overall, I I don't have many issues with the performance. So, with that being said, I will say during the concert, I had multiple extremely annoying people around me who were just moving <laughs> like they had their seats right here and then like halfway through the show they just moved over here right in front of me and then I felt like my row was just up and down all night as far as leaving going and getting a drink coming back that happened so many times or like going to the bathroom and coming back and i'm telling you it was like almost the whole row was doing it all night it was extremely frustrating uh so i will say because of so, like because of some of these negative factors um overall it was it was it sounds horrible, but the worst concert I've ever been to. <laughs> and I, I hate to say that because it really had nothing to do with Jane's addiction and their performance. It was just everything else. Like I said, when you factor in the merchandise, the annoying people, the uncomfortable seats, and also the opening acts, which I either, <laughs> they weren't my cup of tea or I just didn't think they were good. And also it just kind of like, I wouldn't say the night dragged, but once again, it, I'm not used to the acts like coming on later like that. So I will say it was difficult to like get into the show and you might be like shocked, <laughs> nothing shocking. You might be shocked because I said so many good things about the performance, but like I said, it really wasn't about the performance. It was just all the other stuff. Um, there was just a lot of negativity if you take the performance away all you know almost all the other stuff was it was it was difficult it was disappointing um and uh yeah and I'm, I'm i'm very i hate to say that and i might get a lot of flack for this they might just some people might just be like fuck you but i've never had a i've never had an experience like this where it was just it was so much like annoying shit going on like the whole night <laughs> for the most part um which is just disappointing I, I wish I, I in retrospect I wish I would have gotten the pit tickets I think it would have been a much more enjoyable experience and I would I mean I'm sure there still would have been annoying things as there always are there always is but I don't think it would have been nearly as bad um uh so yeah that that was that's Jane's addiction um uh, my ears were ringing a little bit after the show, but um, 
leaving the venue it was easy just got you know went right out into the parking lot got in my car and left of course there's a little bit of traffic but getting back on the highway was a breeze once again worst concert i've ever been to not because of jane's addiction but because of the other factors and uh just really kind of floored me with uh <laughs> all that other stuff happening but i definitely recommend going out and seeing them the prices aren't that bad and uh, they put on a good show i definitely will never forget this concert <laughs> um but if you're going to daily's place i highly recommend getting pit tickets if you can afford them and not getting an actual seat um not a big fan of this venue um but yeah Oh, I did want to mention one last thing. So when I got home, I, uh, I laid my shirt out and I really analyzed it even further. And unfortunately, <laughs> that was another disappointing thing. I mean, I already knew the merch was like a disappointing factor, but analyzing it even further, <sighs> the front of my shirt, like the, uh, the graphic on the front was crooked. And also you could see like the square around where they like pressed the picture so it was clearly just like a gray t-shirt and they just like cheaply pressed the the shit on the front and uh it, it left like a if you really look at it closely you can see like the the crooked square around the graphic and then on top of that i didn't realize and this is maybe my fault but I, then again i'm like why the fuck didn't they do this the tour dates on this particular shirt didn't they had the dates but they didn't have 2024 in there which is disappointing to me i uh i want the year on the shirt and I'm, for from now on i am 100 percent like making fucking sure it says the year on it and i want to say the other two shirts had the, the year on it i know for sure at least the, at least the one did but i don't know how they why they didn't have the year on this shirt but anyway once again frustrating but it is what it is um so jane's addiction crossed them off the bucket list i'm actually speaking of bucket list i'm going to see buckethead guitar player for the third time tomorrow night in orlando i'm gonna have a vlog and another concert review coming up um hope you all enjoy it. i hope if you went to the show you had a way better experience and uh you know for the diehard fans please don't get upset with me and I mean, some people like will take this shit personally and be really upset because I'm being honest with my opinion as far as like the other factors that uh, were detrimental to my experience. But um, hope if you went, you had a great time. I hope if you're uh, going to see them, it's a great time. I, I really think uh, if you just plan it out and really think about the, some of these things, uh, you can make it an even better experience than um, than it could be um so yeah i just wanted to throw that out there so jane's addiction uh 2024 august 27th in jacksonville florida daily's place thank you all so much for watching please comment like subscribe and i'll see you on the next one